I'm Chris Lowell. And I'm Mo Narang. And we have Nerdy Minds. We're here with Chris Lowell and Mo Narang. Yeah. Narang. Yeah. And they have created the film Besides Still Waters. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So, as we sort of briefly mentioned before, you know, a lot of people want to get out of their hometown as fast as they possibly can and just never come back. Huh. What was it about, you know, growing up and where you grew up that made you actually want to not only revisit it, but make an entire film sort of based on your life there? Yeah, it's actually, we've never been asked that before. I think it's yeah. a great question. I, it's true. It's, I remember going to, I think I was honestly really fortunate in the world that I grew up in. Um, I loved growing up in the South. I loved growing up in Atlanta. And uh, I went to a great school and I had a lot of great friends there. And I remember getting to college and meeting all these people who could not have left home faster. I mean, they were so glad and they were not looking back. And meanwhile, I am like in my little dorm room with photographs of my friends up on the walls and I'm just sobbing with nostalgia. And, um, and, and I think my friends all had kind of a similar reaction. Um, in so much as we really all wanted to be together. So we, we traveled back as often as we could and uh, we just kind of kept coming back to this house where we grew up in, in North Georgia up at Lake Raven. And, um, and we just couldn't get enough of it. And so we were there, we would come back for New Year's, we'd come back any spring breaks, we'd come back for summer and we'd always kind of get together in this house. And, and um, I don't know, I, I really... It's funny, there was a time, I remember when I was like 15 or 16 years old, when I had auditioned for something that happened to be in Atlanta, because there was a time when nothing was going on in Atlanta, and I remember getting approached by a couple agents and managers to who wanted to sign me to be an actor, which was exciting at the time, obviously, and... Um, I remember them saying that it would entail me having to be out of Atlanta a lot because, you know, 15 years ago, the only places you would go to audition would either you'd drive up to Wilmington or you'd, get, or you'd go to New Orleans. And I knew that that would mean I would have to be away from my friends and school and this, and I just thought that was not worth the sacrifice to me. I think, I think our friends have always been our, the biggest priority in our lives. So, yeah. yeah. Now, how long have you guys been friends? I know you said you were a long time. We've been friends since college, actually. Um, so I kind of met Chris and this whole group of Atlanta people in college and kind of got adopted into their um, group of friends. And I started coming down to the lake house pretty immediately. And um, and even in the few short years I had, I, I obviously don't have that long history with it, but in the few short years I had, the, the memories we formed there were so rich. Um, it, it really became sort of a seminal place for me too. Um, yeah. And and then saying goodbye to it just became that much more difficult and um, that much more of a genesis for this film. The way you guys sort of um, described it in the on the Kickstarter page and everything, it sounds almost like you guys were living almost like one of those like 80s comedies or like The Big Chill or something where you have this group of friends who right. just, I mean, it, it well, sounds well, almost well, unbelievable. You know, it's a great, that's a great reference. I mean, we talk about the, the I, I think you would be lying to yourself if you tried to make a film that's sort of a reunion uh, group of friends in a house without referencing movies like The Big Chill or Return of Sakaka 7. I, you know, th those are like, those films kind of like define that genre. Yeah. And, um, and we love that. Um, with, with us, you know, with The Big Chill, a lot of like the themes of that film is it's these people who are just reaching middle age and they're suddenly thinking to themselves, oh my God, what a tragedy, I've become my parents. You know, and they're looking back on the choices they made and, and where they had their passion and where they kind of went awry or, or followed the path that was maybe a little bit more lucrative financially, but not emotionally. Abandoned their like political beliefs. Or childhood or, yeah, dreams. Yeah, a recurring theme in that film. Um, and with our film, it's sort of what we like about it is... It's 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 in sync with the big chill, but it's almost the generation, one generation younger. So it's with these people, it's all at a time when they're at the crossroads of making those choices with their lives, and are they going to follow the sort of their their passionate dreams, or are they going to sort of settle? And and then more importantly, the the relationship to the parents is different too. In the big chill, it's all like, what a tragedy I've become. Film, it's a little, a, there's a real theme of what a tragedy. I'll never be my parents, I'll never live up to you know. And, right. I, and I think that's something that I think uh, is very 
kind of indicative of, of, of our generation is we sort of started talking about it we thought about like where our parents were when they were our age and they had families and jobs and careers and and they and they none of those things and, and they you know and they boycotted Vietnam right. and they went to freaking Woodstock and it's sort of like they live these kind of like hero, this sort of hero age in America and I think there's this real sense of like we're never going to live up to that right um, which is kind of an ongoing theme in the film as well can we take a pause for a moment? Yeah, sure. It's kind of windy out here, and I think that mm-hmm. might affect the audio. Can you tell us, like, if you were passing someone on the street, they haven't heard of your film, you're trying to get them to back it on Kickstarter, tell us about your film in just kind of passing. Okay, so basically the, the film is about a young man whose parents die in this car accident, and nobody comes to the funeral. So... And he's losing the house where he grew up, this guy. So in this desperate attempt to sort of reclaim his youth and kind of cling to his past and his sense of home and family, he basically guilts all these people who didn't show up to come help him sort of move out of the house and also celebrate how much fun they had in in this place when they were growing up. And as people start to arrive, you start to realize that none of them really remember the house that well and it's not as special to them as it is to him. And it's really about his journey uh, of kind of coming to terms with growing up and losing this big chapter in his life and sort of moving on. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that's the yeah. sort of bullet point version of it. Kind of thematically, it's just about kind of like loss and um, nostalgia. There's, there's certainly he's this hyper nostalgic, really wanting to reach back and rekindle this golden age he has in his mind. Um, and uh, and I think one of the themes that's resonated with a lot of people is uh, this sense that the people who knew you, the relationship you have with the people you knew when you were young gets very complicated as you grow older because you do have this rich history, but you also kind of grow into different people. Um, and but it's funny. But it's funny. <laughs> it's a comedy. <laughs> nice. And now you mentioned having to guilt him, having to guilt people to, to come. You mm-hmm. didn't have to do that for your film, probably. People were jumping at the bit to come act with you, or what? Well, you know, it was, it was actually really interesting when we. It was. It was a really great process for us, the um, casting process, because we didn't want to. We kind of when we were fundraising for the movie, we were kind of doing our research on ensemble movies and we watched pretty much every one every movie that could possibly inform how we cast and put this movie together we've seen it probably twice and we just kind of realized over the course of that that cast chemistry makes or breaks these films so when we were casting it was really important to us that we be able to audition people that we get to have them read together and we get to see their chemistry come to life. That they all commit to rehearsal and more importantly that they commit to run of picture, so which means they're there the whole time. So a lot of times with mega celebrities, it's offer only, especially at a budget as low as ours, it's an offer only situation. They don't read with anybody else. They never you never hear them actually say the dialogue. They show up the night before they shoot and they leave the morning that they rap and their reps are trying to get them out as quickly as possible. And so it's, you're just really like rolling the dice that they're going to have any chemistry whatsoever. And we really wanted to have... Every, it, was a, it was a mandate that everybody audition who's going to be in this movie. Because Mo and I really... You know, it was our first film. We wanted to make sure that they could that they could be these characters. That they could speak this way. And that, they, that, that, that our words fit well on them. Um, and we could not be more proud of the p- cast we ended up with. We freaking love these guys. Yeah. They've become like our best friends. And... Uh, and yeah, I just I, I'm just so proud of of yeah. I think they're the, I think they're the the big achievement of the movie is their chemistry. Yeah. Kind of from the moment we cast them, I think we knew that however the film itself turned out that we were going to be able to take a pretty big victory lap on this cast. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you know any of uh, this cast before they auditioned for the film, or were these all new faces for they you? They were pretty much all strangers. I had met the, 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 the except for one, except for one. Beck Bennett, um, who Please. plays Tom, he's he was my freshman year roommate at college. Literally, I walked in the door, and this is the guy that I met. And he's one of those actors whose talent is so immediately recognizable. I mean, you could just see it a mile away. And he really struggled for years after college because right when he graduated, it was when the writer's strike happened, and he just took a long time to get his footing. 
And I've always known he was a genius. And so when it came time to cast this part, which Mo and I had written with him in mind, he came in on audition like everybody else, and he would just blew everyone out of the water. And I really had to fight with the other producers to get this guy cast. And I think more often than not, when people talk about the film, their favorite character in the film is the one that Beck plays. And also, ironically now, he's, our, like, he's probably of, one of our one most of our well-known actors, actors yeah. in the movie, because now he's on Saturday Night Live, and he's just exploding that. He's right. amazing. He's such a comedic genius. I mean, what, what makes me happy, though, is that in the film, you get to see Beck's talent uh, comedically, but you also get to see what he, his gravitas yeah. as an actor, which is important. Do you keep up with the different shows and movies that your actors from this are on, and which is your favorite? Oh, wow. Good question. All right, so what do we got? We got The Blacklist, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live, Veep, Veep, and Enlisted with Jesse. <laughs> yeah, Jesse's on Enlisted. <laughs> with Jesse right, Hodge yeah. is on Enlisted. Um, I obviously watch Enlisted, <laughs> um, but I, truthfully, like most of the reason is to watch Jesse, because right. we have a blast together. I love, I love kind of... I just it, I, I felt like I got to I won the lottery being able to yeah. like you know I've like fallen behind on Agents of Shield and Blacklist which kind of like I've heard I was talking we were talking to Ryan the other day apparently his character just had a, a an awesome yeah. couple episodes on the Blacklist yeah, so, so I'm excited don't spoil him for me I'm excited to like catch up and and Brett too I think is really it seems like he's found his groove or Agents of Shield is starting to sort of become part of the bigger Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is really exciting. Um, obviously, like, when that happened for Brett, all of us were ecstatic. Um, and I kind of eat that, like, the comic book world up, so... Yeah, Mo's a big comic yeah. nut. And then, and then ever since day one, we've been watching Veep. Right. I, like, Veep was something we binge-watched while we were waiting for Reed to, like, fly to set. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember that yeah. in, 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 in our friggin... In, like, our little hotel room in uh, Novi, Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... So I, I, uh, yeah, that's I don't know if we have a favorite. Yeah, all of them. It's, it's, all of them. Yeah, I guess. I you know what? It's just like it. It really has been awesome to see like these people who we know and love and have always known how talented they are, like actually start to come into the public eye and like the world start to realize that as well. Now, um, um, you mentioned Agents of Shield, and yeah. that's a Joss Whedon show, mm -hmm. and Piz on Veronica Mars has a Joss Whedon quote. You, know, yeah. you remember it. Not a right. quote, but a reference. Well, and it's funny, because literally when we were shooting in the movie, I, I walked up, I walked to Rob Thomas, and I said, what the hell is a hell mouth? He's like, it's a Whedon reference. And I was like, okay, dude. Like, those guys just sort of, they just live in the same world, you know? Actually, tonight, uh, uh, Brian, Brian McElhaney, I don't know if you guys know who that is, he's in um, Much Ado About Nothing, and he's part of this... Um, Sketch group, online sketch group called Britannic. That's mm -hmm. hysterical. Joss is actually in one of their sketches. Right. Um, What's well, funny, like, so during the last month at the Lake House, um, Chris moved back there for the last month of escrow, and I moved back there with him to write this script. And uh, kind of all of our friends came back during different periods. And um, so Brian and Nick, who are the sketch group, had come down and. I remember vividly sitting in the living room on the couch, and Nick had Whedon-esque, which is like the Joss Whedon fan site, up, and he he's like, someone's posted about us on Whedon-esque, and I think it's actually Joss. And Joss had posted about how much he loved their sketch comedy. And so, like, while we were making this film, Nick and Brian started developing this relationship with Joss. Um, and then the Joss ended up casting Brett, which yeah, is crazy. Yeah, casting Brett. So, we've, like... We've, we've overlapped in a lot of fun ways. Um, yeah, but... Have you guys watched Joss Whedon material? I mean, obviously I mean, Marvel, but... the Avengers, yeah. I've seen, like, I've seen a couple episodes of Buffy and a couple episodes of Dollhouse. I've seen all of Firefly. Um... What yeah. was Firefly? I fi okay. <laughs> it's like a time we, we, we travel can't, we can't, cowboy. No, 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 we can't. It's space cowboys. We cannot get into it now because okay. it will it'll take too long. Um, I want to hear your 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 explanation for what Firefly is. I saw um, I, I saw Buffy. I watched a lot of Buffy when I was a kid. I think like honestly, what Firefly has become is this like epic. It, it's become one of the epic canceled too soon series. Um, and it was this, like, very witty sort of Western written in space. Um, it's, like, it kind of has all the flavor of everything Joss Whedon does, which is, like, the characters are very rich. He's very um, 
sort of unabashed with putting them through difficult scenarios and really like putting them through serious pain so you get very connected to them and like the problem with firefly i think uh it was on fox fox aired them out of order yep yep which Chris knows all about from Enlisted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, like it just got dumped, and then it sort of came out on DVD, and everybody got to watch it sequentially and realize what a brilliant show it was. Um, and then years later, they got to do a movie called Serenity, which was kind of the capstone to Firefly. But kind of like coming back to... Um, what were we talking about before Firefly? <laughs> no, like, no, that's all I can think about. Buffy and Joss Whedon um, Project. Oh, really um, well, Astonishing X-Men was kind of like one of my biggest intros to Joss Whedon. Um, I was like late to the party and then kind of went back for it. But Astonishing X-Men was amazing. Um, okay, now yeah. Firefly is similar to, to Veronica Mars in that they had a series canceled too soon kind right. of without right. warning and then came back for a movie and that's kind of where all their fans came from. Right. Did you watch Veronica Mars, Mo? I did not. You did not. So no. you wouldn't even be able to compare the two. Um, like not a, the a series. You know, it's so funny. So I went and saw the movie, and I was very nervous about this because I'd um, I hadn't seen the show. I, I literally leaned forward and had some Veronica Mars fans give me a primer on the first three seasons before the movie started. I was amazed at how engrossed I was with the movie and how much how great a job they did of not on, not only kind of catering to the fan base but also like for someone who hadn't really seen it before really bring me into the world like if there's a second veronica mars movie i'll happily see it and i've I, a lot of my friends who uh came in through similar situations have now kind of gone back and are starting at season one and watching the series um so did you see veronica mars from the beginning chris Hell no. I didn't know <laughs> what I was getting myself into. I got a phone call. I'd heard about the show. I knew it was like a fun, weird, cult, crazy show. I went and auditioned for it with Rob. For And I, I literally, I read the character breakdown, and I just remember thinking, Stosh Piznarski? I was like, there's, there's, there must be a mistypo here. Like, like this has to be Steve... Polinsky or something, you know? Um, and um, he was like, no, your name is Stosh Piznarski. We'll call you Piz. And I was like, okay. Even better. <laughs> um, and I just, yeah, I just, I really, uh, I really just kind of was sold on meeting Rob and Kristen. Those, they were both such wonderful folks. And, and, and frankly, I think that show is way cooler than I am. I, every, like, I always think that someone, they made like a vast mistake by casting me. Like, everybody there is like in such a different world than me. And I just, I sort of feel like I, I'm, I'm the kid that accidententally oh, that? Yeah. accidentally got invited along you know and now that I'm there they're like oh we can't get rid of them so yeah <laughs> and that's perfect because it's just how Piz was yeah exactly Piz is sort of way. I was sort of the outsider can you tell us about whiskey slaps <sighs> sure <laughs> so this is a very stupid game we play basically what happened was we were in DC with our friends and we were drinking we were about to go out we we're in college <gasps> were we in college no. We weren't in college. It was after college. <laughs> and it was like, we went out, we went and had a few drinks, and we were, we, were, we were passing around this bottle of whiskey with a chaser. We ran out of our chaser, whatever it was, soda or whatever. And my friend Lindsay said, well, just take a shot. And I'll slap you across the face. It'll take the sting of the whiskey away. And I was at that point so intoxicated that I was like, that's a great idea. And so I like took a shot, slapped me across the face. I was like, this is spectacular. She's so like, okay, my turn. Boom. Slap. We all did it. And then we, and then that became sort of a token, yeah, outing, party game, yeah, yeah, party game before we'd go out and hit the town. Mm-hmm. We'd hit each other. Yes. Do you do it when you're out? Like, is it like we have? A we bar definitely. Fight? Have. It's really, it's, it's really it's not, not a fight. good idea. Yeah, it's it gets a little rowdy. It, I think a lot of people try to like really throw some intense slaps and. Uh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, this is this is gonna sound crazy. But the, the best, best combination is guy girl, because a guy is never gonna hit that hard. And a girl will wallop the <laughs> shit out of it. Dude. Unload. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like because the problem is when it's when typically when it's two girls, they're both like a little too shy or they're a little too s- sweet with each other. And when it's two guys, it, it turns into macho. this testosterone yeah. festival. Yeah. Um, but no, we've done it. It's. It's. I mean, I'll be honest. We did it like when we were shooting the movie, especially. We did it quite a bit, and we would do it out, and people. You know, and they see someone. They see someone slap somebody across yeah. the face in the middle of a crowded location. They don't necessarily take to it well. Right. <laughs> so I highly recommend if you do it to do it sort of 
in your own space. It's a pretty game. As an aside, can I just say I wish you said testicle festival because it rhymes that instead of be, testosterone. You know what? You can you can Edit take you can yeah. take poetic <laughs> license and <laughs> say that I said testicle festival because that makes you sound cooler. Because that's really good. Okay, um, was it tough for two different people to write one coherent story, or was your history together so extensive that you guys really just everything gelled immediately? We actually we have a really really specific. Process. writing process um, and it's one of the things that I, I love uh, and I don't know anyone else who does this but basically what Mo and I do is we create the outline together so we walk through beat by beat, we try and get it as detailed as we can so we have a fully realized outline and then we go separate, we go off Mo writes an entire full length screenplay by himself, I write an entire full length screenplay by myself and then we mail it to each other and then we read each other's versions and like make all our little notes. And then we get together and we, we sort of do like a Frankenstein draft, blending the two together, the kind of best ofs of each. And that's that's sort of a, or what we call like a draft. So it's great because you kind of get twice the writing. Right, we get a lot of material. And it, what's nice too, I think when you're writing with someone, a lot of times what'll happen is I'll throw out an idea, Mo may not like it, and be like, eh, I don't think so. And it, that's the end of that idea. Where when you do it this way, if I have an idea, I, I kind of have the freedom to run with it through right. an entire screenplay. Even if we never use it, I get to, at least we get to like really flesh it out. And see where it goes. Right. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, I saw in another interview that you mentioned having written something with your girlfriend, a play as yeah. well. Was that process different, writing with you know someone that you were close with in a different way, or how was that different from what you did? Well, that, that that's that's different just because it's um it's it's also we're using only the text of a novel, so it's the words are there. The words are there. It's it's really more of a it's really the 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 task is editing and rearranging like turning it to make it into a story so it's almost it's almost like working backwards uh, like the last the, the goal is to create the outline essentially um, which is very difficult um, but no it's I mean I, I don't think it's definitely been a, it's definitely been a different process we sort of created it together she would do a pass I would do a pass I think it was a little bit more conventional um, the way you and I work is very uh, you know I, I, it's very unique to us I think Besides Still Waters is obviously very important to you and, you know, reflective of your, your own personal history. Did you, Mo, feel like you might step on his toes, his history, step on his history in any way oh, when no. you're writing? Oh, uh, no. Like, by the time we were writing Besides Still Waters together, I was, like, I, I was already so intimately um, connected with that group of friends, and um, I, I certainly didn't feel like it wasn't mine as well. Um, yeah, I think we always, we always talk about, like, I, I don't think I've ever... Th- the pride I have in that house is not that it's mine, but that it's ours. Right. It's that there's a sense of, like, all these people feel ownership over that place. All these people suffer when it, when it's gone. Um, that, to me, is, like, a way much larger accomplishment and for a, for a place. Right. So I think when it came to writing it, when it came to making it, when it came to asking people's help, everybody was on board. Right. Now, outside of whiskey slaps, <clears throat> what else came from real life? Like, straight out. Oh my God! There's a lot of Easter eggs for our buddies. I'm sure they're going to notice them tonight. There, there's a ton. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of things. But there's definitely specific lines that that come out right. in the movie. Um, there's little references, like you'll see written somewhere. Mr. Delano sucks. Is a friend of ours. Yeah. You know, everyone's got like all the beer, all the whiskey, it's all the after, as like, named friends. after our friends. Yeah. Uh, and then and then there's definitely like certainly there are some plot devices which I will not mention, but some major plot devices are taken directly from experience. Directly from experiences with our friends, yeah. Cool. Now, your Kickstarter campaign just exploded. You got all of your funding in less than two days. Yeah. When you initially sort of created it and put it up, what were you realistically expecting to happen? We thought maybe in 35 days we could be hunting for $63,000, like within a couple thousand dollars of it. We like we created the we have so much content cuz we thought we would have to be pushing every inch of the month just to get to 63. Um, yeah, I think we were so overwhelmed when yeah. we hit it on day two, early in day two. And it's funny because, like I said, we have literally a month's worth of content. 
um, to, to put out into the world. And, and, and the reason we set that stretch goal is not because we're sort of feeling greedy and just want to see how much we can get. It's because that the reason it was sixty three thousand twenty one dollars is that that is literally to the dollar amount of money we needed after Kickstarter takes its cut and Amazon payments takes its cut and all of our prizes are paid off. That was the exact number we needed to pay for all of our music, closed captioning, like every little nip, you know insurance, DCP laydowns, and just like barely push our film right. out the so, door. So the money that's being raised now is going to things like actually having a publicist so we can actually market the film and getting it in some theaters and uh, you know, being able to have a real premiere where we can actually have the cast there and you know, like those things that, that but more importantly, and this is the thing I really try to stress is you know, a small films like these distributors are afraid to get behind a lot of times because they don't feel like there's enough of an audience. And so the fact that we can now be like, there's a huge audience. Look at look at what these people right. have done. I mean, in a way, we've been Vocal we've been and committed. Right. And, yeah, yeah, in a way, we've been referring to this as the little league version of the Veronica Mars movie. Um, in so much as I mean, that was really what Rob accomplished more than anything with that Kickstarter campaign was just proving to Warner Brothers that there was this very committed, very passionate following, and that it was worth Warner Brothers' time to give them the rights to make this movie. Um, that's that's definitely how I think we felt about it. Where do you think the majority of your supporters came from? Do you think they were Veronica Mars fans, Enlisted fans? You know, it's, it's, that's the yeah. beauty of it. I think it's been like a really beautiful mix, really. Mix. You know, we'll go down, we'll start looking down the backer list. You know, and again, it's like we, we planned on no more than 400 backers. Right. We were, were oh. over 700. We're over 700 on day five. Day, day, day five, yeah. yeah. And so, um, it's, 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 it's been, but, and you'll see, it's like, you know, we'll scroll through and not recognize really anyone, and then it'll be, you know, a, a distant cousin of Moe's right. and then it'll be Octavia Spencer and then it'll be one of my old high school theater teachers and you know it's, it's just been like such a beautiful mix and, and there will be Veronica Mars fans and there will be enlisted fans um, but a lot of it's really come from kind of all walks of our lives going way back and I, I think being able to scroll down the list and see those names has been it's been it's been pretty emotional we yeah, I, I, yeah Mo and I have just been like, had, like choked up yeah, for days yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't mean to cut you guys off, but we actually have to go relatively soon. That's sure. All. Oh, okay. Then we will uh, sort of uh, skip, to the important parts. skip to the important parts here. Um, <clears throat> you're, you're talking about Enlisted. Um, I actually saw it referred to recently somewhere as sort of a modern-day mash. Sure. Um, where, ideally, where would you like to see that series go, and what sort of what direction would you like to see it take? Well, I'd like to see it go... Season two. Yeah, to a second season. I don't know if that's going to happen. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I love... Again, I, I feel like I have been lucky enough to be attracted to shows that have really unique voices, even if that works to their detriment in terms of being um, kept on the air. Um, the first show I was on was featured, you know, it was like the writers of Freaks and Geeks, and then Veronica Mars was another one, and now Enlisted. I think Enlisted just is like, a, you know... Kevin and Mike have created such a unique world and such an unbelievably balanced mix of really, really funny f comedy and very, very heartfelt, uh, poignant emotion, which I think is so hard to do. Oh, um, back to your actors. At what point did you tell them, so, hey, you have to take your pants off? Oh, the nudity clause? That was that was right out front. That they they knew that was coming real early because it was it was again it was a mandate. It was like we have to, you know. And and again, you, I mean, you'll see the movie tonight. I would. Gratuitous. It's in no way gratuitous. It's more like, you know, really, really, honestly, the, the most nudity in the film is a bunch of people running naked into a into the off a dock into the water. And I was like, we're we're it's a skinny dipping scene. Everyone's gonna go skinny dipping. It's not, you know. I don't want to try and cut around. Like, I feel like when you have to do things like that, like, we're going to stay above your waist somehow or just see your legs. It's like, no, it's, it's, that's not the kind of movie we're making. Like, we're, it's like over the shoulder, you know, handheld, like, guerrilla filmmaking to an extent. And I want to just, like, n like, you guys just go for it. Like, this is not, I promise we're not taking advantage of your naked bodies. Yeah. Um, and the actors, I mean, frankly, all of them had. You know, we, we had all of these pasties and all these things to, for them to cover themselves. And 
within meeting each other for about five minutes, everyone was like, "No, nah, we're, we're all good. We're all yeah. good." Everyone was just like naked. Any any naked scenes, people were just straight up yeah. naked. So you were like the only two not naked people in the room. Or oh no, we well we're also naked. Well, we, we we went skinny dipping with the cast a couple yeah. of times. Yeah, we, we everyone got everyone got naked at one point or another. Yeah. All in good taste. All in good fun. Well, the first time I found out that you were a photographer, I went to your page and boom, there's boobs and sparklers. So it's clear that you yeah. appreciate some artistic nudity. Yes, that's you like putting that in your professional endeavors. But I, you know, it's funny though. I think I think part of the reason that I've been able to photograph so many nudes and 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 people are so. Uh, willing and comfortable to pose uh, for me um, is because I think I, I, I'm i able to communicate even without having to say anything that it's it's for no reason other than to sort of explore like kind of a like I feel like the way I approach nudity a lot of times in my photograph is almost from like a child's eye like the, you know like like before lust and attraction plays into it when bodies are just bodies you know these like strange things that we're living in um, that's kind of the way I, I I sort of like stripping it down to that for lack of a mm-hmm better expression wow. um, alright well thank you for uh, talking with us we really appreciate it and uh, hopefully this will get people to go fund your movie and see your movie uh, last question out of all of, of your characters whether it be Piz or Derek from Enlisted or even these characters that you've created in here sort of who are your favorites and then who are your favorites of his characters and who do you sort of connect with the most whether it be in the film or in something else you've done Oof. Man, that's a loaded question. Um, I think um, I really like. I mean, this is going to sound like a cop out, and I'll I'll save it at the end, so don't worry. I do honestly feel like there are elements of each one of these characters that I I connect with. I think it's part of the reason I've been able to play them is I have to find like an anchor that is me. So, for example, uh, I love I love how kind of dry witted and cynical Derek can be. Um, I think that's a really fun thing to do, and a lot of times when I'm getting snarky with my friends, th- that's the way that it comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the sort of vulnerability and the kind of uh, the vulnerability of Piz and the kind of earnestness. I think that's definitely something that I I relate to a lot. I'm very emotional, and I kind of put my heart on my sleeve like a little too soon, oftentimes. But that's just sort of the way that I. I operate. Um, in terms of characters, I probably must relate to as as, as lame as it is to admit. I, I think Daniel in Besides the Waters is right. is the protagonist in that film is pretty pretty similar to me in a lot of ways. I think they've like there's definitely some core similarities. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the romance, yeah, the nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, big. I'm 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 a very nostalgic person and sort of a hopeless romantic, and and I think that that those were sort of the 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 two descriptions we kind of use when we were first describing our protagonist. Right. Um, what about you, Mihat? Your <laughs> favorite favorite characters of Chris's. <laughs> <laughs> or what's your what would you say your most? Let's let's stick it with BSW. Who, who? I will say like for the sake of enlisted, it has been really nice. I think to see like all of us have known how funny he is, and I don't think that's really come out um, until enlisted, and that's been awesome to see and really celebrate. Um, who do you most relate to in, in Besides, Besides the Waters? It's so tough. The, like, these characters started like very sort of, I want to say almost as caricatures. And I, In drafts 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, I think it would have been very easy for me to say, like, oh, I'm him, and oh, I'm him. Um, now there are moments. It's really like moments that get me that are like very personal, and I think every character has one. But the one I kind of come back to... And I don't want to kind of spoil the movie, but there's like a a sort of climactic scene at the end between two characters, and that scene in particular is something that rocks me every time. Um, It's the scene I'm, in terms of the writing, I'm I'm probably most proud of, and uh, and the actors, yeah, as they are throughout the whole movie, are are stellar, and it just like it it gets me every time. I'm Chris Lowell, and I'm Mona Rang, and we have Nerdy Minds. Hey, what's up? I'm Chris Lowell, and I've got a nerdy mind. Oh, yeah? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm Kristen Bell, and I've got a nerdy mind. Well, Kristen Bell, um, he only winks. 
or blinks or something. He doesn't blink, really. he only blinks. Yeah, yeah, Kristen Bell. Um, you want to make out, Kristen Bell? <laughs> well, yes, Crystal, I do. Kristen Bell? <laughs> Chris, Chris. <laughs> um, well, that's not right at all. He has a madman crush on Piz. No, so, uh, I love I'm not Piz. sure if it translates to Chris Bell, but he has a madman crush on Piz. Piz, that's fine. <laughs> So the, no, then we're we're yeah. we're we're, we're then we hate video. video. We hate video <laughs> we in that case. Yeah, in any way. Yeah. <laughs> if I told you I loved you before, because <laughs> I was drawing. <laughs>